Hello everyone. My longtime viewers, or anyone who has taken a run through the Down the Rabbit Hole playlist on my channel, will be aware of my past examinations, both directly and peripherally, of the Bellevue School District in the state of Washington. Up until today, I had honestly not given much, if any, thought to the district since my last video on the subject back in November. But in my YouTube browsing today, I found a video that had been posted referring to Bellevue along with the phrase, social justice. And, like its predecessors, that video led me to a pair of other videos, all posted as a batch on the same day. Obviously, I had to take a look at them. So, won't you join me as I take another plunge down the rabbit hole? nominated by a colleague in our district and several students and administrators and colleagues got on board nominating us as well and then we just found out recently that we were one of the seven finalist groups for the award. Actually one of the things I've been, if I could be honest, a little conflicted about with this nomination, which I'm honored, incredibly honored to receive, is that uh, there are other voices who've deserved this for long, for far longer than a couple of white guys have. Hardly 30 seconds in and already the racial self-pity begins. Not only is our speaker devaluing his own efforts on the basis of his race, but by extension those that nominated him to the award have a flawed perspective on the worth of someone based on race. I want to use my privilege that I have to draw attention to it. I think it's crucial that white people in general, um, white males specifically, and in education, white male teachers do this work and engage in it to bring about a more equitable system. White people in general white males specifically. And in education, white male teachers need to do this work to bring about a more equitable system. So white people, and white males in particular, possess the power necessary to change the system. They have this power based on the fact that they are white. So our speaker believes in white power? Terry and I worked together with 21 Progress and Project Pilgrimage with some University of Washington students as well last year uh, and took a group of high school students uh, in August, high school and early college students in August down to the South to experience that history, talk to some of these folks, um, engage in some current issues through the lens of that trip. Seattle to Selma. I had hoped to find some video footage of this excursion and maybe there is some out there somewhere. But the only clip I could find within easy reach is one showing how the group like to end their meetings. And if you couldn't quite make that out, the chant was, Stay Woke. It was the most profound conversations when you're faced with the reality of things and it's right before your eyes, it's going to impact you far more. Um, you know, my, my colleague had, had talked about like it's, you know, white, white supremacy and white privilege is like a fish breathing in water, and that trip pulled us out of the water. So prior to that trip, you were a white supremacist? That's an interesting admission. But now you've been purified. Your trip to Selma was akin to making a pilgrimage to Lourdes and bathing in its sanctified waters to wash away your sins. And yet, you both still seem to be apologetic for what you are. So, some stains are just indelible. Bending the Arc is a student-centered um, social justice advocacy organization uh, at Bellevue High School that was started in a partnership with the University of Washington and students there who were doing similar work at the college level, engaging with high school students to try and extend that work down to them and I think has grown into something that is a force for good at Bellevue High School. A force for good. I suppose it depends on your definition of good. If good involves denigrating or elevating kids and their self-images based on their various skin colors, 
Well, that doesn't sound good to me. We're really operating in a pretty safe environment for them to try and be social justice advocates. In a school building is about as safe an environment as, as, it, as it gets. So we're hoping to equip them with strategies that they might use when they go out into the world to still be able to advocate. Would I be correct in interpreting that to mean that Bellevue High School is a safe space? But also, should it be the job of a public high school to train kids towards becoming social activists? To go out into the world and advocate for a specific social ideology? Maybe it's just me, but that sounds awfully creepy. You know, I don't think there's anything particularly special about me doing this award, uh, except that I'm one of the teachers doing it, and it's a teacher award. But I'm, I'm happy to represent all those that have done the work. Uh, and regardless of whether we win or not, I'm, I'm hopeful that this just gives us a platform to continue the work. Um, sometimes it's hard. It, it, it's, it's not always easy. It's mostly <laughs> difficult, actually, to do this work. There's a lot of tension in discussions about race. People have a hard time um, having that conversation. Really? People have a hard time having conversations about race? Well, as a public school teacher, are you approaching those conversations from a standpoint of inherent guilt and flaw over the skin color of some and the inherent disadvantage bestowed on others based on their skin color? I have no idea why that might conjure some difficult conversations. I'm also intrigued by their constant use of the word work, as I have heard it from many people over time, to do this work, or doing the difficult work of, and any number of other iterations. It takes on an almost spiritual or religious connotation, the way I hear it used in these discussions. I find it rather unsettling. And so I think if anything, hopefully this just validates that we need to keep having these conversations. Um, you know, the, the actual award itself is far less significant than continuing to do the hard work of talking about very challenging issues for our students. And that's all for the first video I came across. But as supplementary material from our two speakers, let's take a look at other comments and insight they had to offer from two other pieces. And then I also think that we need to do more to get people of color to want to be teachers. This is not a welcoming environment for a person of color. Uh, it's very much that you have to do things our way, this way, that way. We don't respect people's culture. We don't respect what they bring to it. And that's got to change. We got to incentivize people of color that we want them to be educating our youth. What does a person's personal culture or beliefs have to do with being a good teacher? You're there to teach kids on the basis of a well-rounded curriculum of the fundamentals. Teachers aren't there to make a lesson plan out of their own personal beliefs and practices, are they? But maybe I'm misunderstanding. In what ways are people's cultures not being respected? And why does this lack of respect affect only people of color? Can a white person not have culture? I guess you also then need to define what you mean by culture. But, of course, my questions will have to remain rhetorical, because no clarifications are provided. That our, our students need to see themselves in their teachers. The students need to see themselves in their teachers. This is another notion I hear quite often. So, what does that mean, exactly? Teachers need to be incentivized and hired based on how they are seen? I would love to know what our speaker means by that as well. And I can only do so much as a, as a white male. I know that. I don't have that shared experience. And so we, we got to do more. Right. You can only do so much as a white male. But then, weren't you telling us earlier that white males are the only ones with the power to make the changes you want? I want to use my privilege that I have to draw attention to it. I think it's crucial that white people in general um, white males specifically, and in education, the white male teachers do this work and engage in it to bring about a more equitable system. So, which is it? Do you have the innate power and privilege of your skin? Or are you in self-effacing denial of it? I mean, are you woke? Or aren't you? We, we can either be 
re relational teachers or transactional teachers. And if we're just about the test score and we're just about the AP experience and we're, we're just about academics all the time, uh, kids are gonna collapse under that weight. If you're just about the academics, kids are going to collapse under that weight. So, as a public school teacher, you have an aversion to educating children towards having a grasp of the academics and instead want to focus more on being a relational teacher. I hope he expands on that, but I'm not going to hold my breath. As a new teacher getting involved in this work, I think you just need to follow your passion. Follow your passion. That's not bad advice. I mean, hopefully, if you're a teacher of a particular subject or discipline, you have a passion for it, and can consequently bring that enthusiasm to the school day and inspire your students to learn. It sounds like a good start. And whether that starts out for LGBTQ students, for your black students, for transgender students, whatever it may be, find that area of passion and start learning. Listen to people who are directly impacted that, whether they're people of color or people that are, that are in those struggles. So, not a passion for academics, a passion for a particular subset of your students based on sexual orientation or race. Got it. Is our speaker advising that teachers provide special attention to students based on superficial characteristics to the exclusion of students that don't fall within their passion? I would love to know the answer to that one. And hear them and, and get direction from them. Find community groups that are already doing the work if your school isn't doing the work and find out what they want from you and what they think you can do in education to help improve. Consult outside special interest groups to find out how you can better teach students to advocate for what they want. Got it. And really just you know, take your marching orders from others and, and learn how to be humble. It's gonna be uncomfortable uh, to, to learn to deal with your own privilege and the position that we're in. Take your marching orders from others. Be humble. Got it. I mean, we're, we're all teachers and we all love kids and we all believe that education is this conduit for opportunity. It's a conduit for opportunity, yes. However, I sense a but coming. But how do you reconcile that you're a teacher that works in a system that historically has affected so many negatively? So, as a teacher, you must both bear the burden and attempt to cleanse yourself of the sins of the past. By becoming an educator, you have made yourself complicit in past misdeeds in which you had no role. Wow. If that is the philosophy you relay to your students and the public at large, I can't imagine why you're having such difficulty in attracting teachers who are included in the demographics you say are the inherent victims of the education system. And so use that, use that energy, use that passion, use that pain um, that you hear from students, right? Talk to your students. They have the stories, they have the moments that are going to inspire you to do this work and make it almost where you can't not do this work because how can you look at those students in the face again after they've shared their heart and their pain and say, well, I was too busy. Use that pain, be humble, talk to your students, and use their stories to inspire you. Take your marching orders from others. This work is difficult and uncomfortable, but it needs to be done because it is a force for good. <sighs> the comparisons to religion, to my mind specifically Catholicism, are unavoidable to me. An ideology of possessing an inherent flaw and from this having then an obligation to bring the word, or the work, in this case, to the masses. That the heathen may share in the revelation of their privilege, and from this do their own work to pass along the hope for salvation to others of their kind. And all the while, our speakers look to those who possess that hidden wisdom, that special insight into truth bestowed upon them by the very nature of their sexuality or their skin color. That by doing so, our speakers might struggle, as those students who obviously have struggled because of what they are, to correct within themselves the unavoidable nature of their crime 
of merely existing alongside them. I wish these two men were in the running for an award for teaching, rather than one for preaching. As always, thank you for watching.